is essentially that there are certain positive bugs that we just see over and over and over again. Right? So if you look at the OWASP top 10, or you look at you know, the SANS top 25 and so on, uh, you'll find that there's uh, certain positive bugs, SQL injection, plus scripting, and the various web application uh, bugs, XSRS, and so on, that just keep appearing over and over again, and we just don't seem to be getting rid of them using the uh, existing approaches, like you know, code review, developer education, static analysis. Doesn't, doesn't seem to work. These bugs just stick around. And this is our experience with Google um, XSS. Is like, we have basically, before we started this work, we have like hundreds of them every year. Uh, they just keep happening. Um, my intuition why this is the case comes down to um, the fact that developers write code on top of APIs that are inherently prone to particular classes of vulnerabilities, right? So if you're writing code against a SQL query API um, and you're not careful, you'll introduce a SQL injection bug. Uh, similarly, if you're writing code against the web platform API, you're dealing with a very complicated API that's full of sharp edges and there's very, very many opportunities for you to introduce mistakes that then result in vulnerability bug, uh, vulnerabilities or security bugs or vulnerabilities. Um, and so basically, you know, what we have, uh, the situation we have is that we expect developers to always, in every single one of those cases where they use these APIs, be very careful and beware of all the security considerations, which, by the way, are often orthogonal to the primary purpose of this API, right? The SQL query API doesn't really have that much to do with security. It's about querying data from a database. And the web platform is about rendering UI. And the fact that there is actually security considerations is sort of a secondary concern, so it's, it's very easy to actually forget that as you're developing, right? Um, and these APIs are often very widely used. Uh, if you look at the web platform APIs in a large-scale web application, you'll find probably hundreds if not thousands of code sites that could potentially result in a bug. And so developers are human, they make mistakes, so we're basically in a situation where we have many potential bugs and then therefore some actual bugs. It's, it's, it's pretty much just inevit inevitable, right? And then, uh, what we have to do is, because we now have code that has bugs in it, uh, we have to try and isolate those, find those, eliminate them before we ship the bugs, uh, before we ship the, the code to production. Of course, unfortunately, the approaches that we have at our disposal there are inherently incomplete. We're relying on static analysis tools that are inherently incomplete. We're relying on testing. We're relying on human code review. We'll never find all the bugs once they're introduced. And so we're going to ship some of them produc to production, and we're in a, in a bad place. Right? So what I'm... Um, essentially proposing is to instead uh, take the view that really the problem is with the API, right? The problem is not with the developer uh, who is making mistakes. The problem is that we have designed APIs that permit the introduction of bugs that are kind of secondary or orthogonal to the primary purpose of the API, and in particular then are bugs that result in security vulnerabilities. And that's really an unreasonable burden that we're placing on the developer and it doesn't work, right? So what we need to do is, in fact, put the burden on the API and the API's, API's design, the API's implementation, to ensure that it's impossible for the developer to make these subtle mistakes as they're using the API. So what we want is what I call inherently safe APIs. I guess my slides are cut off here a little bit. Um, and uh, what, what that means is basically an API that has roughly the same or has the same functionality as the one that's there to date, but also has the property that it doesn't allow the developer to accidentally introduce bugs that then result in security vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, of course, we have to make these APIs usable, so we have to make them approximately as convenient uh, to use as the original uh, vulnerability-prone API. Now that's an interesting question. Can we actually do this, right? Is this practical? Can we come up with APIs that are both constrained enough to prevent application code from being written on top of the API uh, that might have security vulnerabilities, but at the same time expressive enough so that our developer can still write the code uh, that she needs to write and uh, do so productively, right? So we're, we're, we, uh, we have to make sure that these APIs are actually usable. So what I'd like to do for the, um, for the remainder of the talk, for the most part, is just talk about two areas where we worked on this problem and where I think we actually reasonably well succeeded in, in coming up with solutions to that. The first thing I want to talk is about uh, SQL injection. I don't think I need to explain this. This is kind of unfortunate that it's cut off here. I'm afraid to mess with it, but um, I don't know. Does anybody know how to make Mac screens like show up the right way? No. Um, so I, I'm not going to explain 
SQL injection detail, I think everybody here knows um, what, what the problem is. Uh, what it comes down to is that basically uh, queries are assembled from strings in program code and then uh, in a way where untrustworthy data, externally controlled data is, is somehow introduced in the query and then uh, results in an attacker's ability to modify the syntax and the semantics of the, the query. Um, so far, the existing best practices to try and avoid these types of bugs is that we tell developers, well, you should be using prepared statements, uh, which if they're used consistently, it prevents the bug because all the uh, externally controlled data, the parameters to the query, are introduced uh, sort of out of band through bind variables, and so there can't be any injection. Unfortunately, uh, as we've seen, you know, developers, as we all know, developers are humans and they'll sometimes make mistakes. They forget about the guideline or they just aren't aware of it when they start coding. Uh, and so then we end up with code that doesn't use prepared statements and so therefore is potentially vulnerable and then sometimes actually vulnerable. Uh, we also may sometimes run into situations where they follow the spirit of the rule, so they're using prepared statements, but they sort of miss the whole point and they, we end up with code like this that you know, is injectable despite the fact. Uh, that it's using uh, the prepare statement API. Um, the other um, approach that we sort of ask developers to consider is to use uh, structural query API, uh, stru structural query builder APIs, things like Hibernate's criteria where uh, you actually use a programmatic API to assemble the structure of the query and then that's also inherently safe from injection. Unfortunately, that's also pretty cumbersome, right? For a more complex query, this gets quite tedious as opposed to the convenience of writing SQL. So the question is, can, can we come up with, a, with an API that allows developers to basically still build queries from string concatenation, but in a way that uh, prevents the introduction of, um, of injection vulnerabilities? And here's an API that basically does that. It's a very, very simple API. It's just a wrapper for a string builder. Um, and the only thing it does is that it has an append method that says you're only supposed to append uh, strings that come from a constant compile time constant expression. A compile time constant expression is part of the program, so it's inherently trustworthy. Um, and so what we basically then end up with is the invariant that the result from using this builder is a string that's a composition, a concatenation of compile time constant strings, which means there cannot be uh, any um, untrusted data flow dependent or any dependency, data flow dependency on untrusted data uh, into that query, which means there can't be any injection, right? You can only append constants to the query, compile time constants, which means you can't write code that injects anything that's not trustworthy. Now, of course, the problem is, you know, uh, as we know, developers don't always read documentation. So if we just had this, uh, this API with a documentation, please only call this with compile time constant expressions, it, I can guarantee you that within weeks or months, we'd have code like this, right, where somebody forgets to do that, doesn't read the uh, documentation, and then we end up basically in square one. We end up with code that is injectable. And so to prevent this, what we did is we added a static checker to our Java, Java tool chain that keys off on this um, at compile time constant annotation there and essentially enforces that for any call site of a method with a param parameter that's declared at compile time constant, we enforce at compile time that the actual parameter is actually compile time constant expression. And so uh, we implement this, and so if you now try to compile this code in the Google toolchain, in our Java toolchain, that has this checker plugin built into it, uh, it won't compile. It'll give you a compiler error. And so with that, you really cannot write code against this API that has even a potential SQL injection. It basically enforces by the design of the API in combination with this little checker uh, that, the, um, that uh, the, the query is a concatenation of, of compile time constant strings and therefore not injectable. Um, so now if we look at the resulting code sort of in the before and after world, we also see that the structure of the code is basically the same, right? Uh, the, the old API is using ad hoc string concatenation to build a query and the new safe API is still doing that. We're still appending strings to the query. The only difference is that we use query builder dot, dot append instead of uh, plus equals on a string. And then of course, we can see that on the left side, there is actually a SQL injection vulnerability in that code because we're concatenating a untrustworthy uh, external input to the query. So we actually have a bug here. And now if we try to transliterate that into the new API, it wouldn't compile. Uh, and then that compels us to 
uh, use a, so you can't see this, but I mean here it'll, it'll basically be using a, um, a, um, um, a bind parameter for this rating parameter, right? So uh, basically the API compels the developer to actually follow the best practice that they're supposed to be following anyway. Uh, and if they don't, they get a compiler error that tells them, points them to the documentation for this builder and, uh, and tells them what to do. Um, the other thing that you can kind of see here is that we added a little bit of um, additional syntactic sugar to the, if you will, to the API. So the API, since we now have a builder, uh, doesn't only assemble the query itself, it also allows us to add code or add methods to assemble the bind parameters, which then allows you to move the uh, statement that binds the value for a particular parameter right next to the place where the uh, parameter is introduced in the query. So um, for instance, this binds user ID that's in this code uh, inserted into the query here, but over there, we can actually move this right next to the statement where uh, the user ID parameter is, is um, introduced into the query. And again, unfortunately, you can't see this. So how did this turn out in practice? We basically went and implemented uh, builder APIs in this style for uh, databases that are in use at, at Google. Uh, this includes F1 and Spanner, which are planet scale, highly scalable databases that are used to back um, end user facing applications. Uh, and there's you know, various papers at conferences if you want to read about them. And then Hibernate, which is more uh, frequently used. Uh, it doesn't really scale to that scale, but it's quite frequently used in internal facing applications. Uh, so we implement these builders and then we did a global refactoring of all the existing client code of the original query APIs and changed it uh, to use the new safe query builder API. Uh, this was a couple of quarter, person quarters worth of effort, but in the end it wasn't that hard because as we've seen, the structure of the old code and the new code is basically the same. So it's an almost, I mean, it was actually in some cases automatable, the refactoring, but it wasn't very hard, right? It was just sort of somewhat tedious. And then if you consider that, you know, there's like probably you know, a couple of thousands of developers writing code at Google against these APIs, the fact that it was like, you know, a, a few person quarters to clean up uh, is really a very modest effort, right? Um, uh, so it was actually very reasonable. And then once we we're done with that global refactoring, we removed the original uh, execute query of a string method that is that's inherently prone to code that might be vulnerable from injections from the API altogether. It's gone. And so with that, the public API for those databases really does not allow you to write code that is even potentially injectable, right? It just won't even compile. It's, it's impossible. So basically in return for these you know, few person quarter efforts, we now are completely done worrying about SQL injection. You just can't write code that has SQL injection. So this was a pretty nice result. Um, the other thing I want to stress is that the implementation is really very, very straightforward, right? So there are no like complicated uh, whole program taint, static taint analysis checkers or anything involved. It's that builder that you basically saw the essence of it on one slide. And then the static checker, which is implemented in error prone, which is a open source um, static checker pluggable framework that essentially allows you to write um, uh, predicates on the uh, type annotated Java syntax tree. And in that framework, uh, it's probably like 50 or 100 lines of code to write this checker. It's very, very simple, right? So basically in return for a couple hundred lines of code of implementation, we get actually a very rigorous guarantee that SQL injection simply can't happen. Uh, and uh, all this without any kind of complicated uh, static analysis. So this was actually a, a pretty, pretty nice result. Uh, now you noticed maybe this little asterisk here when, when I said we removed this execute query uh, method. The thing is there's always exceptions, right? So um, how much time do I have? 12, 20, right? Okay. Um, so there's, there's certain uh, scenarios where this safe API, because it has the constraint that the query is a concatenation of program constants, essentially, um, is not usable to implement what you're trying to implement. A canonical example would be a um, command line utility for the database, which by design gets the query from standard input, uh, and so it can't be a compile time constant string. In that case, injection is not a concern because the principal who is providing the query is the same as the principal that's authenticated to the database and they're by design supposed to be able to execute any query against the tables that they have access to at the database level, right? So we still need to be able to implement this. And to do this, uh, what we did is essentially provide a, um, uh, a, con a restricted uh, but unconstrained API that effectively still gives you the execute query of a string behavior that's potentially uh, injection prone, uh, 
but we made it subject to security view, and we actually, because we have a lot of developers that may not always read the, the, read the documentation that tells them that they should be getting a review before using this API, uh, we actually put a mechanism in place to enforce that the review took place. And to do that, we used a mechanism in our build system, which is also open source as Bazel, um, that allows you to specify for certain libraries a whitelist of uh, packages that may use that, right? And so essentially if somebody wants to use this, this backdoor API, so to speak, um, they have to get on that whitelist and for that they need our approval because we own that directory. And so they, they can't just start and use it, they have to come talk to us, which is what we want, right? And, but once they've convinced us that their use case is reasonable, it's very, very lightweight. Uh, we just add them to the whitelist, it's one change list and, and they're good to go. And then of course uh, what, what you know, sort of is essential for this whole thing to work or to be practical is that uh, this exceptional API is only necessary in a very small number of call sites, and this turned out to be the case. So we found that when we did this refactoring, almost all the code that was there could be refactored to use the safe API, and there were only a very small number of exceptions where we had to use the uh, unsafe API that requires manual review um, for that, and so this worked out pretty well. Okay, so whoa. Uh, oh no, what happened? Uh, let me move on to talk about cross-site scripting a little bit. Um, so, okay, so uh, I think the, the, um, the reason cross-site scripting is such a particularly intractable class of bug, uh, in, in sort of my intuition, uh, seems to stem from the fact that there is very, very many potential injection sinks, many pot uh, potentially vulnerable code sites uh, in a, in a large-scale web app. Uh, often hundreds, if not thousands, and then on top of that, the data that flows into these injection sink sinks uh, very frequently comes from far away in the program. So we are dealing with uh, complex whole system data flows into those APIs, which are very difficult to reason about. So as an example, I have a little slice of a typical web app as it might exist at Google, um, where we see some code that's implemented in browser-side JavaScript that renders some UI and then the data that goes into that uh, UI comes from a bunch of backends. So the web application front end, and then the back end, and then there's some storage layer. Now, if we're uh, a um, unfortunate security engineer who has to review this app for uh, cross-site scripting bugs, what we'll basically do is we'll start with the injection sinks. So we'll start in browser-side code, and we look for things like assignments to inner HTML, because that's where sort of the, the trouble starts, so to speak. And so we'll find one here. Uh, we see that what goes into that is uh, HTML markup that's been composed using ad hoc string concatenation. So we look at what happens here, and we can kind of see that there's uh, two sort of subsidiary injection points, if you will, where variables are um, introduced into that markup that's being constructed here. And we can see there's one here, uh, which is a whole, it's called profile. So this is profile is like an, a holder, it's like a, a uh, message object um, a, a, or a POJO or whatever that uh, contains a bunch of fields of, of uh, user data, so a domain object, I guess you would call it. Um, and we can see that they, um, they actually went and HTML escaped this before putting it into this href uh, attribute, uh, but they omitted code that does any kind of validation, right? So uh, we don't know what would happen if this homepage value could be JavaScript colon some malicious code, in which case there would be an injection. And there's no code here that does this validation, so we sort of have to guess that maybe they relied on uh, input validation of that field of that data when it somehow made it into the system earlier, but we really don't know. So that's something we'll have to validate, right? Because there's no, um, no code that does the actual validation at runtime right there. And then the other thing we see is there is a field called about HTML that gets inserted into a div. And so this whole thing is like a part of a profile page that renders um, you know, a piece of a user's uh, profile in some like, you know, photo sharing application or a social network or something like that. And so the intent here is that this contains a subset of HTML markup that is hopefully safe, is hopefully uh, inert and will not cause JavaScript execution. The intent is sort of from a feature perspective that users can write about themselves and they can use fonts and they can use inline images and that kind of stuff, uh, emoticons, Nyancats, whatever. Um, and uh, so we expect to see a subset of HTML uh, fonts and boldface and that kind of stuff, uh, but there shouldn't be any script tags in there. But again, there's no code here that validates this, right? So uh, if we're doing a review of this piece of code, we have to validate or we have to uh, ascertain where that data comes from and, and make sure that somehow along the, the data flow path into this, into this code, uh, this, uh, this validation took place, right? Uh, 
So we'll see where does this data come from. Well, we're getting it passed here. We get this uh, this profile object, this uh, domain object um, from a an RPC response or so an XML HTTP request from a web app front end. So we're here. We're now in Java code, and, and this is the uh, Google protocol buffer that is what generates this domain object. But this could be a piece of Java code either. Um, uh, also, so we're seeing here there's a bunch of Java code that uh, actually just gets this profile object from a backend, which is now written in C++. And here we're reading it from a database, from a, a profile storage database, some schema. And then uh, we're still not sure if there is a vulnerability or not because we haven't seen any validation along the way here, right? Um, so presumably this application relies on external input validation. But now we can see that there might actually be like several front ends that write to this profile store, right? There might be uh, a back end for a mobile app, there might be a developer facing REST API, and there might be a profile management uh, front end, and there might be, be even cons internal customer service applications, who knows, right? So now we actually have to look at all of these to figure out where the hell does this data come from. So this is, we're quickly very deep down a rabbit hole. This is quickly becoming intractable, right? And this is also something, if you look at it, uh, that's essentially a hopeless problem for a, an automated uh, uh, static analysis system to try and reason about this whole system data flow, because we're going like across three different uh, languages, two different RPC mechanisms, uh, a storage schema, and then who knows what goes in here, right? So uh, this gets very, very intractable and uh, very, very difficult. So what do we do about this? Well, the first area we want to address is the ad hoc construction of uh, HTML. Oh, how do I go on here now? Yeah, this is tedious. Yeah, go back into presentation mode. Um, so um, the, the, uh, the first thing we want to address is the ad hoc concatenation of HTML markup. What we did is we introduced uh, templating systems that are contextually auto-escaping, uh, which means that the template system actually understands HTML markup and it knows in which context in the HTML markup each substitution takes place. Right? So the, the template system will basically parse the HTML markup in the template and then figure out uh, what context all these uh, substitutions take place and then infer appropriate runtime sanitization and escaping to ensure that no cross-site scripting can take place. Uh, and so in this case, the template system would infer uh, these escaping directives, uh, which in the old version, the developer might have had to actually put in there manually, but now the template system enforces them or infers them and puts them there uh, on its own. And we can see that it worked out that uh, here, this is, uh, is, is basically the body of an element, so we just need to HTML escape. This one appears in a URL valued attribute, so we first need to validate that this is a safe URL. It's not JavaScript something something, it's a well-formed HTTP URL. And then we HTML escape, and then here we're again in, inside a, an element, so we HTML escape. So this is great because uh, now the template system basically makes a promise, it has a guarantee that uh, for arbitrary inputs into the template system, as long as the template itself compiles, uh, we have the guarantee that the resulting markup cannot result in XSS because the template system guarantees that it'll always correctly validate and escape the data at runtime. So there, there can't be any XSS bugs from rendering this template. So this is, this is wonderful, except we have the problem that here there's actually a feature that expects us to render HTML that we're getting from somewhere, right? So if we just Leave, left this as is, uh, we'd be escaping the HTML markup that's in here, like the bold tags that are in the sort of rich text format HTML that should be rendered here. So we need a mechanism to turn off the automatic escaping here. What we used to do is we had directives, like no auto escape that the developer could put here uh, that would turn this off. But we found that then again, we're back in this place where we still have to analyze this long data flow into this field to figure out if the appropriate sanitization of that markup or the safe construction of that markup actually took place. So this didn't really help us and it actually resulted in a number of bugs. And so what we did instead is we uh, came up with a different mechanism to instruct the template system to suppress the automatically inferred uh, escaping or sanitization and it's based on types. So we introduce a vocabulary of these types that are basically string-like objects uh, but they carry along with them uh, contracts, promises that say that their values have to be sa are safe to use in a particular context. So the type safe HTML is safe to use in HTML markup in an HTML markup context, like inside an element in HTML markup in a template, or it's safe to assign to inner HTML. Um, safe URL, same as safe for URL contexts. Um, and uh, the contracts are insured by those um, those types public APIs. So we have. 
factory methods and builders and sanitizers that themselves ensure that if you get an instance of one of those types back from that API, uh, it guarantees that the value actually adheres to its type contract. So we can then basically use these type contracts as assumptions uh, in the sinks to, to, to basically suppress uh, automatic escaping because we know that the value is already safe for that context. And so the, the template system essentially keys off these types and when it sees a value of type safe HTML, it'll not run it through the automatic escaping that it would normally do because it knows it's already safe to use in that context. So that's the mechanism that we use to suppress the um, automatic escaping. Uh, the other thing that goes with that is coding rules that uh, essentially prohibit the use of the um, regular injection prone, vulnerability prone DOM APIs. So for instance, assignments to inner HTML uh, and uh, assignments to location href are basically banned from application code uh, and instead, you're supposed to use a safe wrapper, for instance, rendering one of those templates or uh, using a little wrapper for um, assignments to location href that uh, does sanitization at runtime. So we're basically layering across or on top of the DOM API that's full of sharp edges, a wrapper API that is uh, safe and mostly relies on these types to achieve that safety. Um, and the, those, those constraints are enforced by a compile time check, which is basically a, just a white list of call sites uh, where, where uh, essentially the only assignment to inner HTML should occur inside those wrapper libraries, but it should never occur in application code. And then, uh, let me back out of this again here so you can see the whole thing. Um, wh when we now look at uh, the same slice of this application, um, in this new model, so in code that is conformant to this coding rule, we see that uh, the situation looks a lot better, right? Um, so we, we now find that um, because we're adhering to the coding rule that no more assignments to inner HTML and things like that are allowed in application code, well, there aren't any, right? I mean, they're gone. Instead, they're using, uh, the render, they're using one of these safe templates, they're rendering a safe template uh, which again is something that cannot by design result in XSS. So from a reviewer's perspective, not something we have to look at. Um, in order to suppress the automatic escaping of this particular field, uh, the developer now had to do something special, uh, which is to use one of these types. So in this, uh, in this domain object, they had to change the type of this field from string to safe HTML, which is then what has the, uh, what instructs the template system to suppress the automatic escaping because it basically tells it to rely on that type contract, don't do your automatic escaping because the type promises that its value is already safe to use in that context. Um, now if we go, and then basically this domain object just threads the whole way through across all these RPCs across the different languages. And now if we're in the back end where we read the data from a, from a database, things get a little bit interesting because we now have a type mismatch, right? The, the data that comes out of the database, out of that column, is, is a string, but what we actually need to put into that domain object is safe HTML. So we somehow need to make that conversion. And we don't have a public API by design that just lets you uh, promise, that just lets you bless a string as, as the type safe HTML because we know that that would be misused uh, based on experience. So instead what we do is we have a bunch of libraries that um, allow you to either construct uh, HTML using sort of a DOM-like builder API or we have a sanitizer uh, module that is a, a commonly shared library that takes as input an arbitrary string that is assumed to contain HTML markup, but we assume it's ma malicious. And then that whole thing gets parsed and uh, reduced to, um, to uh, basically a safe subset, an inert subset of HTML markup. And then the result of that gets returned to you, the caller, the application, in the form of this uh, type safe HTML because um, by design, the sanitizer reduces an arbitrary input to a string that satisfies a type contract, in this case, that it's safe to use as HTML. So the backend now changed to basically read the data from the database, pass it through the sanitizer, and then we have the right type to stick into this domain object, and everything trickles through, and everybody's happy, and it, it just works. Now, if we look at this from the perspective of a security reviewer, it gets very interesting because there's now very little for us to look at to establish the property that this application is free of XSS because um, essentially what we need to do is we look at their compiler configuration, make sure they are actually using our uh, whitelisting rules and we, we, we double check that they don't have any extra entries on the whitelist basically. But if we don't see that, 
then we know that uh, their JavaScript front-end code is not using assignments to inner HTML. So there's nothing for us to look at. Uh, we know that the only way they can still render into the DOM is using safe wrappers, such as, for instance, using strict template systems or these other type-safe APIs. We don't have to look at that. Um, the types just flow through the system. We don't really have to look at that. The only thing we actually have to look at is to the direct fan in into code that makes a, a conversion from a plain string uh, to this type, because that's really the security sensitive uh, operation. We're basically claiming that a string actually has that type contract. And in this case, the only place where we see this used is actually this common library that's already been viewed, obviously. Uh, and so uh, we don't actually have anything to look at, basically. So we're, we're, we effectively are now in a position, instead of having to read pretty much the entire app, all the front-end code, and reason about these complicated data flows, uh, we're pretty much done with looking for XSS in like 15 minutes, right? Because all we need to do is make sure that they are adhering, that they have the static checks in place to adhere to the coding guideline. And uh, we have to look if they have any application-specific uh, fan in into these unchecked conversion methods that bless a string as one of those types. And if they don't, there's really no way for their application code to be responsible for an XSS, right? So there's nothing for us to look at. So this is really very compelling because uh, it, it, it actually makes our uh, code review task uh, tractable. Okay, I gotta skeet up a little bit here, I think. Um, So in terms of practical application, we basically implemented this. We implemented uh, these strict contextual templating systems uh, in a couple of template systems, including some open source ones. There's also a couple of Google internal ones. Um, and then had worked with um, some flagship products, like Google+, Gmail, and so on, uh, to op adopt this approach. And uh, they actually did a lot of work to refactor the existing uh, front-end code to follow this coding guideline effectively. And uh, we did see very drastic reduction in bugs, right? So uh, bugs are, XSS bugs are pretty, pretty prevalent. Uh, we have probably across all of Google several hundreds every year. And then we saw that in these applications that adopted this approach, their bug count went down drastically, right? So in one of those cases, they had something like 30 XSS in 2011, and then it took them like a year or whatever to do the refactoring over time. Uh, and then they really have had no, ap approximately zero, so I'm, I'm fudging a little bit, uh, XSS since 2013, uh, after they were done with this, uh, with this adoption. Uh, the fudge is due to the fact that there were some XSS, but they were ones where you, um, you basically are still within the confines of our goal, which is to make it so that application code cannot be responsible for XSS. So we had, a, we had one or two where there was actually a bug in one of these infrastructure libraries and the template system. And then there's a couple of other classes of XSS that are not related to rendering HTML markup or the use of the DOM API. So things like rendering um, untrusted data in your domain uh, without the right HTML headers or HTTP headers and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so we've had a couple of those, but they're sort of outside of the scope of this, uh, this effort. But uh, within, uh, or in terms of bugs that were really, you know, uh, that would have been there uh, and the, uh, uh, would have been the fault of application code that's engaged in rendering UI, we really haven't had any after that this was being adopted. So this is, this is pretty nice. Um, cool, so in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to uh, sort of summarize and extrapolate a little bit on uh, sort of some of the um, uh, approaches uh, to the API design that underlies this, this, uh, this work. Um, basically, what this comes down to is that we are introducing these, um, these safe APIs that are designed to make it impossible for client code, for application code built on top of them to have certain specific classes of security bugs. Right? And so what we're doing with that is that we're effectively eliminating the potential for bugs that otherwise was there because the, the underlying original API had a potential bug in every single one of its uses, so all over the application. And we're now eliminating that uh, potential for those bugs because now an API is being used that simply doesn't allow the bug to occur. Um, and so what we've done effectively is we've eliminated these, this bug potential from all the application code and have confined it in the uh, implementation of those APIs, right? There's still, of course, um, uh, potential bugs there, but it has to be in the code that implements those APIs, uh, which is sort of, you could think of it as the trusted uh, compute base, uh, the trusted code base with respect to this particular property. And so this, of course, then, uh, in, in practice, in a large-scale application constitutes a huge reduction of potential for bugs, right? Because 
previously we had potential bugs all over application code, and now we just have them inside the API, which is a very small fraction of the code base. And then as we've seen, in particular in the case of XSS, this really result, results in a, in a pretty drastic reduction in many cases of the actual bugs that we see resulting from that potential. Um, a key principle in the design of these APIs is that uh, we, we, the API designer, don't allow, us, uh, don't allow ourselves to make any unsupported assumption about data that comes across the API boundary uh, to us. So in particular, we're not allowed to make any assumptions whatsoever about values of uh, basic types in particular strings, uh, which then in turn means that if we get a string and we're using it inside the API in a context that is prone to injection, uh, for instance, it's a string that we're then using uh, in an HTML element or something like that, uh, we are responsible for taking that data and making it safe, right? So we're responsible for applying the necessary runtime validation or escaping or whatever is necessary to make the data safe. It's our responsibility, it's no longer the responsibility of our client. And we're not allowed to make any assumptions about our clients doing the right thing sort of on their own uh, basis, right? Because we've seen that uh, asking developers to do that just doesn't work, so it's, it's squarely on us. Um, what's interesting is you might think this results in a lot of extra overhead, but it actually really doesn't because this uh, runtime escaping uh, which is more, for the most part what we're talking about, is something that anyway has to take place, right? So it doesn't really matter if the data is trusted or not trusted. If we're taking a string that presents, represents text and we're using it in an HTML element, we have to HTML escape it. If it's, not, if it's a trusted string, if it's a string that's controlled by the application, forgetting that results not in a security bug, but it could still result in a rendering error because we're not escaping stuff correctly, right? So we, we anyway have to escape. Uh, we any, anyway have to escape the data irrespective of whether or not it came from an untrusted source or if it came from a trusted source. And this is sort of mostly the case, which means we're not actually doing a lot of extra work. We're just moving um, where that work takes place and who's responsible for it, right? Previously, it was sort of the responsibility of the application code to do this somewhere, and now it's just basically our job. It's the API's job. The other sort of interesting thing to think about is that this is sort of this approach is kind of a bit of a, a dual to the a chain tracking uh, approach that is usually used to think about injection problems, right? Injection problems are really uh, problems related to uh, untrustworthy data flow that comes from somewhere and then makes it to an injection, th injection sink where it causes trouble. And so it's natural to think about this in terms of uh, techniques that rely on tracking that taint, right? So we have uh, static analysis, which is basically static whole program taint analysis, and we have maybe dynamic chain tracking analysis. Um, but it turns out that this is actually not a very efficient way to approach this problem because in an interesting application, most of the variables that float around are user data. They're untrusted data, right? So we're basically trying to track all these vari variables that are coming uh, through very, very complex whole system data flows. And so we're setting us up for a very, very intractable problem. And what we're doing here is sort of the exact opposite. We're just assuming that everything that gets to the API, unless proven otherwise, is potentially unsafe and we just deal with it at runtime. Right? So it's a much, much simpler approach uh, that then also gives us more rigorous guarantees because this is something that we can do reliably, whereas whole program tainting is, is, is basically always a heuristic. Right? I mean, we can't, we can't do it reliably. And now we get to the unless proven otherwise uh, aspect because there are some cases where we, our API actually has to make assumption about the data because otherwise it, wouldn't, it just wouldn't be able to do what we expect from it. And the way we do this is through these types, right? So we use types to uh, substantiate assumptions about data that comes into the API. And uh, so what we kind of see is that basically the type contract is sort of a mechanism that allows us to, if you will, teleport a promise or a property of the data that we've established somewhere at its source. So in the example that was in the back end where we ran it through the HTML sanitizer library. And then uh, we teleport that promise about the data uh, all the way to the sync where we have to rely on it, which is in this case in the template system where we're inserting it into the template without, uh, without any kind of escaping, right? And uh, so we basically use this mechanism to allow us to uh, reason about the whole program property that there is no uh, omitted escaping or validation that had to take place, uh, but using a mechanism that allows us to do this without having to read the whole program, right? So we can, we basically use types to give us sort of a form of local reasoning to establish whole program properties. Um, that, and that's, I, I think, a pretty, pretty powerful uh, mechanism. Um, 
there's of course one key assumption in there, which is that these types have integrity, right? So we, we rely on no application code digging behind the uh, public APIs of these types and messing with their internals and just you know writing an arbitrary string into the string that's wrapped inside a safe HTML. That's generally a reasonable assumption because our threat model for this is that the developer is not actually malicious, they're, they're just human and make mistakes, right? So we're not worried about developers that actively try to subvert this. Uh, we've had some situations where people were getting a little bit overly creative, but you know we deal with that on a sort of case-by-case -case basis. Um, just a few words about the sort of practical ability, uh, usability of this, the practicality of this approach, which is of course key, right? I mean, uh, non, this, this whole, whole work would be pointless if it wasn't usable uh, in real world software development. Um, one thing that I think is key for this is that we, um, we, we've come up with APIs that are very similar uh, in terms of the API itself and the resulting coding patterns as the original API. So in the SQL case, for instance, we're still allowing the de developer to use string concatenation to build their queries. The code really has the exact same structure as before. We're just adding this little constraint to make sure that they stick to the best practice of always using bind parameters and using queries that are themselves trustworthy. Uh, same thing in the, in the uh, XSS case. The template system is the same one that they used before. So for instance, closure templates, we just strengthened its uh, properties in terms of the escaping that it applies to all the data. And we made sort of a very simple and straightforward contract between the template and its users, which says the template's always responsible for uh, security properties for, for absence of, of XSS. Um, the uh, other aspect is that there is always going to be exceptions. And so we chose not to try and make the primary API more complex to accommodate all these exceptions. We kept this very simple. In the case of the SQL uh, example, it was basically utterly trivial, pretty much. Uh, and instead, we just rely on a, on a lightweight mechanism to accommodate these exceptions, where we allow developers to use the previous, effectively, unconstrained API, but make it subject to a mandatory review. And if it does, doesn't happen very often, it's totally tractable, right? So for instance, in the SQL realm, um, it's basically like, you know, probably, 3% of my time to take care of this for the whole company because I get like a question about this backdoor API, whatever, every couple of weeks and then half the time they need it, half the time they don't, we talk and, and that's it, right? So it's, it's very lightweight. Um, the other thing that we found to be very helpful is uh, that in this approach, we're surfacing errors that pertain to potential security bugs at compile time. Uh, so th most of the time, these are just type errors that happen from incorrect, uh, type incorrect usage of an API uh, or it could be um, you know, this uh, incorrect use of this API that wants a compile time constant expression, which really is kind of a, it's a custom type annotation, if you will. So it, it smells like a type error. Uh, it's very easy for developers to understand. It's just a compiler error that they're used to getting anyway. Um, and uh, it's, it's also very clear cut, right? It's not like a potential bug that you're getting from some tool that comes on later on after you've checked in the code and then the static analysis ran on it. And then uh, you have to deal with these potential issues. Uh, you're just using the API wrong. The documentation says you're supposed to give it a compile time exp constant expression, and you didn't. It's, it's a clear-cut error, right? And so that makes it very straightforward for developers to reason about. And also, you don't get into the situation where code's already checked in, and then you have a potential bug, and then you have to argue with people whether or not that merits uh, a refactoring, right? It's, it never even gets that far because it never even compiles. So that's actually, I think, uh, very helpful in practice. And then uh, finally, there's uh, sort of another angle to look at this, which is um, that this is really about design for re reviewability, which, by which I mean, uh, so the property of, um, if you will, how much of an overall application's code base do I actually have to look at, do I have to understand and analyze and reason about to establish a particular property of the whole program, in this case, absence of a particular class of bugs, absence of SQL injection, absence of uh, XSS. How much of the whole code do I have to read? Um, and sort of thinking about this practically, if the answer to that question is I have to read a pretty good chunk of the overall app, right, of the application code, then this is just not going to work because uh, it's a lot of code. I don't have time to read it. I, have, uh, I don't have tools that really can understand it accurately. Uh, and it's constantly changing underneath of me. And so uh, it, that approach really just makes it almost inevitable that there will be bugs. Whereas in this case, we end up with, um, by design, a situation where the, um, the code I need to review is the implementations of the API, which is a very, very small fraction of the code base. And uh, so we, we actually end up in a situation where it's 
possible for us to read all the code in depth and analyze in depth and uh, test and do whatever we need to do to get confidence in its correctness uh, for the code that is responsible for avoiding the bug, which is the implementations of these APIs, the template system, uh, the, the, that SQL query builder. Uh, and um, so we, we basically are now in a situation where we can very, very uh, um, sort of in-depth review the code that, is, that pertains to uh, that particular class of bugs, and hence we can get um, a high confidence assessment out of that. Whereas in the previous case, we kind of had to sort of hope we kind of caught some of the bugs in the big app that we kind of read part of it, right? And so uh, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, different game with that. And so with that, I'm uh, done. I hopefully have time for a few questions. Uh, as I mentioned, a bunch of this work is, is uh, in uh, open source projects. So there's a bunch of template systems that were open source. And so the, the code we added to it is, is there as well. I think these slides will be published. So these are all links to the uh, respective pages. Um, and with that, I hopefully I have time for a couple of questions. Thank you. Uh, no, so, so the question is, does this, uh, does this rely on, uh, on type safe and statically typed languages? Uh, not really. I mean, so in fact, uh, Clojure Templates is dynamically typed. So the decision whether or not a value is of type safe HTML or a plain string and then hence needs to be escaped happens at runtime. Um, all we need is that these types are reasonably well encapsulated. So, uh, and that sort of depends a lot on the idiomatic use of the language, right? So for instance, in Java, somebody could use reflection to poke inside those types, but you don't really see reflection-based code in application code. If you send that for code review, somebody will go after you with a big stick, right? Now, in other languages, I'm not familiar with Ruby all that much, but from what I can tell, there's like the use of mix-ins is, is pretty, uh, pretty uh, sort of idiomatic. And so therefore, it's kind of more likely that maybe somebody will write code that cracks open a type and then adds behavior to it that actually makes it unsafe and, and violates the, the type contract. Uh, but, but there's no inherent reliance on static typing. I'm personally a big fan of static typing because you get your, your errors earlier, right? But if you like to live dangerously and only find out at runtime that you had a type error, I mean, it's, it still works, right? I mean, it'll just, you'll just know later in the, in the, in the stage of development. Oh, so yeah, so this is interesting. So basically, um, the, the, uh, the property we needed to enforce is that uh, the actual parameter to a particular method is a compile time constant expression. And we couldn't find a way of expressing this in the Java type system. If anybody can think of one, I'd be happy to hear it. Uh, but it turns out we were actually able to do it in C++ and in Go. Um, there's like some obscure ways that will hopefully at some point open source that uh, let you do this. Uh, in, in C++, we also relied on, uh, so uh, Clang, the Clang compiler has this enable if attribute, which is a Clang custom thing that actually kind of allows you to express this property in a somewhat convoluted way, but it, it, it works. And then in Go, uh, there is some trick with, uh, I forget exactly, exa I forget actually exactly how it works, but there's some trick with um, package visibility that allows you to uh, make a type that cannot be constructed, uh, that is basically a string, but it cannot be constructed by code that's not in the same package. And so you, you, can, you can basically um, enforce that property. But in Java, we couldn't, so we need to resort to a, a custom checker. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So the, the question is, um, what control do we have over uh, the libraries that people are using? Uh, I think that is one of the advantages we have at Google is that uh, all development comes out of a single large repository. And um, that allows us to, to uh, keep some lid over uh, what's being used, right? So uh, there is basically a, uh, a process for importing, for instance, third-party libraries that involves uh, people that check about the license and all that kind of stuff, but the security team is plugged into that. So if, for instance, somebody went and wanted to introduce another uh, 
you know, uh, uh, SQL um, ORM layer or another template system, uh, we kind of get to at least see that that's happening. And then um, in some cases, we either find that we need to deal with it and, uh, and um, you know, either argue with them to not do that or find an alternative solution or maybe in their particular case it's okay. And then we, we often use this mechanism that I mentioned, build visibility, which allows you to whitelist users of a particular package, right? And so we say, okay, fine, you're an internal tool, use your favorite template system. It's not really worth our time to, to deal with that. Uh, but before anyone wants to use this in a external facing application, they have to get on that whitelist and you know, we put a comment there that says, please talk to the security team. And usually the owners of these things are responsible and do that. So there's some sort of mix of process and just you know, hoping that people are reasonable and, uh, and some uh, speed bumps, if you will, or, or, or um, um, yeah, measures in the build system itself that, that we use for that. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you.